Well, today we are going to talk about the iconic bus that you see here. And anybody who took a Greyhound ride from around July of 1954 to the mid-1970s probably had a chance to ride in one of these Greyhound GMC Scenic Cruisers. And why are we going to talk about it today? Well, because a lot of automotive companies and stylists were involved in the production of the Greyhound Scenic Cruiser. I already mentioned the GMC was the one who was commissioned to build these coaches. And also a famous automotive and industrial stylist, Raymond Lowy, played an integral role in designing the Cena Cruisers that you see here. Lowy, as we talked about before, was one of the designers on the 1953 Studebaker, and his firm was well known in the automotive industry circles for producing beautiful vehicles and kind of makes sense that he would produce and kind of pen a vehicle like the Cena Cruiser. A total of 1,001 Cena Cruisers were produced by GMC for Greyhound during a relatively brief production run from 1954 to 1956. And while the vehicle was just produced in those three years by GMC for Greyhound, as I mentioned, it stuck in service all the way through to the mid-1970s, with quite a few updates, but the Cena Cruiser also had a lot of innovative features. Now, one of the things to note about the Cena Cruiser is that it, at least in the U.S., was unique for that upper deck where you could observe through the glass on the exterior the roadways and hence the name Cena Cruiser. You had the glass that surrounded you on the perimeter, and then you had those big windows up front that you could stare out of. Children in particular wanted to make sure that they got one of those rows or the seats of the rows where they could see right out through the top of the Cena Cruiser. And if they didn't, according to some bus drivers that I know who, drew, who drove these Cena Cruisers, the children became very upset. But the vehicle had some interesting origins. More specifically, the double-decker type of bus that you see here was relatively common in Europe at the time, though it was not in the United States. And there were even some vehicles that strongly resemble the Cena Cruiser that had come out and were being produced in Europe before the design or a similar design made it stateside. You can see here this particular bus that was produced in Spain called the Pegaso has a very Cena Cruiser-like shape. And this bus was designed in 1949. It was introduced in 1951. So it did precede the Cena Cruiser in terms of its introduction into the marketplace. However, it's hard to say that Pegaso copied the Raymond Lowy style designs because there were some Greyhound prototypes that were being done in the 1940s that had a similar shape to this Pegaso. So presumably, even the Greyhound Scenic Cruiser might have preceded this in terms of its design given the timing of the prototypes and when they were released. Now, the Scenic Cruiser was the result of a seven-year effort between Greyhound and GMC. So it was in development a long time. And one of the proposals, the early prototypes for the Cena Cruiser was what you see here, the so-called GX1 that was designed by Raymond Lowy. Now you can see that this has a double-decker style bus up front. There's seats on the top and seats on the bottom. And then there's a section of stairs kind of in the middle section of the bus and then there's just a final set of chairs that's on the upper level where the bus occupants are sitting above the axles. So this is really how the Cena Cruiser started. And this is the patent for the GX1 prototype. You notice the patent number there on the right side is dated August 14th, 1951. But notice the patent was filed in 1944. So the design began long before 1951. You also notice the name of O.S. Caesar at all. O.S. Caesar was the president of Greyhound. So he has his name on this particular patent. And if you look in the left section behind the bottom drawing, you'll also see the name of Raymond Lowy. So Raymond Lowy has his name on this particular patent, as does the president of Greyhound, whom uh, I guess he believed had a significant influence on the vehicle overall. He did, in fact, have a significant influence on the next generation prototype, which was the GX2, which came out several years after the GX1, based on the learnings from this particular prototype. And those learnings included several items. The first was that this particular bus, the GX1, was too tall to fit in many Greyhound garages. And as a result, Orville Caesar 
dictated that the next generation prototype was going to be lower overall. It was also going to be kind of like a step and a half design, if you will, versus the true double decker. That was his decision that he made. And another was that this particular GX1 coach was 35 feet long, which was typical of coaches during the era. But the president of Greyhound wanted the next bus to be even longer. And so the Scenic Cruiser and the GX2 prototype would be 40 feet long. And while they look absolutely massive by today's standards, most buses today are actually about 45 feet long. So the final Scenic Cruiser as well as the GX2 would actually end up being about five feet shorter than the modern day bus, although they are considerably longer than the 35 foot buses that were typical of the era prior to the Cena Cruiser. Now, given those mandates from the Greyhound president, this GX2 prototype would go into service in 1952 after being designed around 1948. And it's starting to look pretty similar to a Cena Cruiser here. This was actually built by Greyhound itself in its Chicago production facility or engineering facility and was a collaboration between Greyhound and GM as well as Raymond Lowy. Now, you notice that you have that kind of deck and a half design here that I was talking about that was mandated by Greyhound's president. As I mentioned, this was a 40-foot long bus, so it was longer than the GX1 prototype. And it had a number of interesting features. This bus was powered by a GMC Detroit diesel 671 inline six-cylinder engine. And it had a four-speed non-synchronized manual, as was typical for the time, with a two-speed splitter. So you effectively had eight forward speeds. You kind of had a one, two, three, four in both a low and a high. That was a relatively reliable set, at least that portion of it. But the hydraulic system on this bus drove just about everything from the wipers up front to the power steering and even the brakes. So a lot was on this hydraulic setup and it contained seven gallons of hydraulic fluid in the system, which were sometimes pumped at up to 1500 PSI, although around 900 PSI was relatively typical. Now, interestingly, unlike the GX1 patent that named Raymond Lowy on it, the patent for the GX2 does not name Raymond Lowy. Instead, it names Albert Boca, who was a designer at General Motors during this particular time frame, and leaves Lowy absent from the overall patent. Although, like I said, his firm did collaborate in the production of the GX2 prototype along with GMC together with Greyhound Engineering. So there was involvement from Raymond Lowy. It just was more perhaps peripheral than on the GX1. Lowy would again contribute on the final Cena Cruiser. And one other difference between this GX2 prototype and the final Cena Cruiser, this one had its drive axle as the rearmost axle. The Cena Cruiser, interestingly, would have the drive axle as the axle ahead of the rearmost one. We'll show you a cutaway picture here from a Greyhound brochure so you can see what I mean. Let's transition now to talking about the final Cena Cruiser that was introduced in 1954. And here we have a cutaway view of the Greyhound Cena Cruiser from a brochure of the time. And it's talking about a number of the features of the coach. Now, first is, you notice this is very similar to the GX2 prototype. But take a look at the drive section there. And you'll notice the drive shaft is running from the transmission to, as I mentioned, not the rearmost axle, but the one in front of that, closer to the front. That was a change from the GX2. And another change from the GX2 was the transmission. GX2 had a four-speed with a two-speed splitter. Here, Greyhound went with a three-speed with a two-speed splitter. I'm not sure if they were trying to save a little bit of cost. Most Greyhounds at this time just had a four-speed manual transmission. And here, I guess Greyhound may have figured, well, we got a three-speed with a splitter with low and high, so you effectively have six forward speeds. That should be enough. Well, it's an interesting concept. Not quite sure why they did that. Remember, these transmissions were not synchronized, so you did have to double clutch to engage the gears on either the three speeds or the four speeds that I was previously mentioning. And perhaps the strangest thing about the final Cena Cruiser was that it did not employ the 671 diesel that the GX2 did, but I suppose it was deemed that that didn't have enough power. And so the Cena Cruisers were initially powered by two GM Detroit diesel 471 inline four cylinder engines. So they had twin four-cylinder engines that were coupled by a fluid coupling. And 
there was no eight cylinder GM diesel at the time. So I guess they wanted more power. And of course, GM was not about to put some competitive diesel in a GMC motor coach. So they devised this setup where they put two 471 diesels out back to power the Cena Cruiser running through that non-synchronized Spicer three-speed manual transmission with a two-speed splitter. Well, you can imagine what ended up happening. These engines weren't always all that well synchronized and they would get out of tune. And when they were running, I actually did talk to a Greyhound bus driver who drove one of these back in the day and he said they pulled really well up hills. But it was rare that they were actually operating in form. And he said many of the drivers would actually kind of monkey around with them, think that they were amateur mechanics. And that was part of the issue was that the drivers thought that they were mechanics. They were tweaking the engines. The people in the service bays at Greyhound didn't necessarily know how to service the 471s that were coupled together. And the training wasn't all that great. The parts weren't all that great. And so this was one of the major Achilles heels on the final Cena Cruiser was those twin four-cylinder diesel engines that just really they couldn't quite get right. And so after several years, Greyhound actually ended up retrofitting all of the Cena Cruisers with the GM Detroit Diesel 8V71 diesels. And those were very, very reliable, produced for many years. And they also changed the transmission from the three-speed over to the four-speed at the same time. I think another issue, according to the driver that I talked to about the Cena Cruisers, was that many Greyhound drivers were just used to the four-speeds as opposed to the three-speeds. There was a different shift pattern. And of course, as I mentioned, you had the two-speed splitter. And I don't think that they liked the novelty of that design over the tried-and-true four-speed. You also notice that this brochure calls attention to the power steering and power brakes. So those were some driver niceties so that the individual didn't have to deal with uh, arm handling the steering while they were trying to shift a non-synchronized transmission, as an example. At least you just had to deal with the non-synchronized transmission. The coaches were all air-conditioned, so you could have air conditioning or heat. Interestingly, they had little exhaust vents, if you will, up at the top that would pull in the cigarette smoke and kind of take it out of the bus. You have to remember that this was a time frame during which people obviously still smoked. Uh, and they had air suspension, so something that was pretty novel for the time. And the Cena Cruisers did consequently ride quite well, and other GMC motor coaches would employ air suspension for years later, including the GMC motorhome of the 1970s. And here's another advertisement from the time talking about the Cena Cruisers' various luxuries. And you can see here the attendant who is standing in front of the beautiful dual panes of glass up front there, providing the truly scenic view. Greyhound did offer both a stop service as well as some non-stop service to select destinations, so you could just get on the bus and drive. And of course, these had a laboratory facility that you could use that was at the bottom of the stairs on the left there. So you could ride in air-conditioned comfort if that were the appropriate time of the year, or heated comfort, and lots of storage space on these particular buses as well. And here's a view out of an unfortunately gutted Cena Cruiser, but you can still see the panoramic view that you would have had from the upper deck. I'm sure it was a sight to behold and truly a luxury for travel back in the day. Remember, this was obviously at a time before jet airplanes were crossing the skies uh, with, let's say, extreme levels of frequency. It was still relatively rare. So this was a luxurious way to travel. Now let's switch to the interior and notice this picture of a restored Cena Cruiser and pay particular attention to the seat fabric that is here. It's kind of this interwoven design that is an interesting color and it was specifically chosen so that it would not show spots. <laughs> that was interesting that Greyhound together with Raymond Lowy actually selected the seat fabrics in these Cena Cruisers so that as they wore over time, you would not see the spots on the seats. I don't know what to think of that. I guess it was a good idea. And as I mentioned, these Cena Cruisers did last in service for a good period of time. They were first delivered in 1954. Some of them continued on through the mid-1970s, so almost a 20-year run, albeit they were mechanically upgraded, as I mentioned, with the 8V71 diesel and four-speed transmission from the original twin four-cylinder engines. I wish that there were more written about the twin four-cylinder engines or that there were pictures of them, but 
Because all of them were retrofitted, I can't really find any in operation, and I can't find all that much about the engineering as a consequence of the 471s and how they operate in tandem. If anybody knows, put a comment in the comment section. I can expound upon it on a later video. So what do you think about the Cena Cruiser? This interesting combination of Greyhound GMC engineering together with Raymond Lowy and Associates on the styling. Uh, it just really was the confluence of a lot of powerhouses in the design and engineering areas that came together for the Cena Cruiser and produced something that was very memorable for many individuals who were traveling in the 1950s through 1970s by bus. It also influenced the design of its successor that you can see here, the so-called GMC Buffalo Bus, that's so named for obvious reasons. But the Cena Cruiser was a sight to behold back in the 50s through the 1970s, despite its flaws like the engine and transmission, as I mentioned. They also had some frame cracking issues, so that wouldn't be good, but they were pretty sweet. Do you remember about riding around in a Cena Cruiser when you were a kid or an adult? Put a comment in the comment section. Thanks again for watching.